Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap today, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for our speaker, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. And we're also going to be doing a drawing for two $50 Amazon gift cards at the end of today's webinar. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our two lucky winners. Okay, with that, we will go ahead and kick off today's DevOps.com webinar, which is From Monoliths to Microservices, A Tale of Migrations. Our speaker today is Stephanie Baum, who is Senior Solutions Architect at Lightstep. Hi, Stephanie, how are you? Thanks for joining me. Hi, thank you for having me. Great, great. Well, I know you have a great presentation on tap, so I'm going to put myself on mute and let you get right to it. Great. So let's get started. Um, so, yep, I am Stephanie um, from Lightstep. So we're an observability tool. Um, I have seen a lot of this type of subject matter before. Um, monoliths and microservices, regardless of uh, which architecture you use, uh, you need observability tools. So um, in this section, we'll be covering the pros and cons of uh, monoliths versus microservices um, and the implications of migrating your system over uh, to microservices from monoliths. Um, in this particular part, uh, we'll be covering uh, understanding when it's time to split a monolith apart and tips on how to do that effectively. So a little bit about my background before we begin. Um, so this had thought is pretty funny. It's not my professional one, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I look a little mean, I think, but I promise I'm a nice person. <laughs> um, I am a solution architect. Originally, I uh, used to be an engineer. Um, I've worked in consulting before, also worked with serverless a lot. Um, so I've seen a lot of uh, migrations uh, to microservices in my tenure. Um, and at Lightstep, I uh, am a solution architect for our most enterprise accounts. I've uh, definitely seen a lot of the challenges, uh, both organizationally and uh, technically, with uh, making switches over to microservices um, and what all of that entails. So here are just some quotes across the web uh, that I found of what a monolith is and what a microservice is. Um, I think it's pretty funny how uh, different, everyone views these two words, right? So this particular quote, a monolith is an entire application that runs in a single process. I mean, maybe, um, but it could be multiple processes. Um, a monolith is any system that's not built out of independent microservices. Uh, well, that's kind of a circular definition there. <laughs> um, and then the microservice definition here, very small single purpose service that does one thing and one thing only. Um, not necessarily. <laughs> that could be a serverless function maybe, but microservices um, might be able to do more than one thing, I think. So I guess the point here is um, there are a lot of different definitions here, but these are actually architectural patterns so there isn't one solid definition. These words mainly exist just to help us understand our architectural choices as we uh, develop our systems. So regardless of whether you wanna be pedantic about these definitions or not, um, these are just architectural patterns, really. So there isn't like an exact definition of either. So first I'd love to walk through um, an architecture example, just to show everyone uh, both like what a monolithic architecture could look like and uh, what the move to microservices could look like. Um, and this definitely varies a lot, because like I said, there isn't a solid definition of either. They're really just architecture uh, patterns. So 
In this example, we can think of a backend application hosting an e-commerce website. Um, here's some of the features that this might handle, right? So add item to cart, checkout cart, promotions and coupons, email notifications, uh, log in and log out. These are all typical features that we might see in an e-commerce website, for example. If we were to use domain-driven design principles, we could say that it handles several models here, including payments, inventory, promotions, authorization, and notifications. Uh, so if you're not familiar with domain-driven design, essentially uh, this is principles that are used to uh, describe the, the entities or database models that you're interacting with um, to help reason about your system and what it does. You could also maybe consider each of these different features as API endpoints um, on our backend application, essentially. And here's just a super simplified diagram of what this might look like in a more monolithic architecture. So we've got our API gateway here, um, and this is where all requests will hit before they go into our backend system, which is this blue box. Um, you can think of this as a single container um, regardless of whether you're running microservices or monoliths, in general these days, you usually run inside containers. Um, so in this case, we've got some of the features that I just talked about um, displayed here as API endpoints. So add item to cart, buy items, log in and email user. Each of these different features is going to hit various external dependencies here. And these dependencies could actually be represented in a database. They could be um, in a third-party API, for example. The whole point here is that these are external dependencies that uh, multiple features rely on, right? So some of these are shared. So add item to cart talks to cart storage and inventory storage uh, to basically keep track of the user's cart, maybe, and to check inventory when you add an item to cart and mark that item unavailable. Uh, buy items, in this case, is talking to cart storage and a third party, party payment service. So this could be calling out um, to something like Stripe to process a more party. And it also talks to the cart storage to figure out uh, what items are currently stored in the user's cart. Um, and again, this is greatly simplified. Uh, here's a login feature. So this is talking to a third party again. Maybe it's talking to Auth0, for example. And it's also talking to our account storage where maybe we have the username and whether the user is activated or not stored. Um, and lastly, we've got email user. And this could be talking to some kind of SNS provider or email provider to push that email notification or push that text message, et cetera. Um, and it also talks to account storage to figure out uh, what that user's email is. So why is this called a monolith? Well. Um, essentially, it's all in one container, and it's all running in its own application. Um, there's a lot of shared dependencies here, um, and if I were to try and scale out each of these different features individually, um, I could not, right? I would have to scale the whole container and make copies of my whole container um, every time I wanted to scale. So, for example, if the users were hitting buy items a lot for some reason, like a lot more than any of these other features, uh, that would put some load on my overall um, container instance and maybe would trigger a scaling. But then I'm also replicating all this other functionality as well uh, when I probably would not have to. So that just highlights one of the benefits of having a microservice-based architecture versus a monolith right away, uh, scalability. So here's a more distributed example of what this architecture could look like. Um, again, I'm just walking through each of these to explain the decisions here and try and drive home basically these concepts of microservice oriented architecture versus monolith. Um, so maybe in this case, we actually did this split for security reasons. So as you can see, we have login separate from the other functionalities that we previously had all together. Um, and maybe we did this because we wanted login to be a separate VPC. Maybe we have like a very uh, secure application here where we need a certain separate level of security in our networks. So we have this login 
uh, functionality separated out um, with its own authorization process. And you'll see here that I've also split out uh, storage. So um, this account storage still remains, but now we have this new storage, authorization storage. So one thing that people do usually uh, when splitting out uh, monoliths into microservices is also split up the data storage, because this also means that your data storage is scalable. And here's another example. So let's say we actually um, have a lot more uh, payment third party calls than we thought happening, and we need to split out that particular external dependency. <clears throat> let's say that um, maybe we also have another feature that's not in this diagram that is calling the third party payment service a lot and needs to process large batch payments asynchronously. So we wanted to add in some type of queue or something in front of it. So now we've done this interesting split where we still have all of our uh, original functionalities here in this container, but we've split out um, this particular dependency so that it can scale and so that we can add a queue in front of it. So this is just another example. Um, again, this is very simplified, but these are just the kinds of decisions that you're making as you scale out your system. And we've got our final example here. So Maybe in this case, we needed to scale out email capabilities. So we separated out the email user functionality from the rest. Um, so maybe we had it to handle uh, email blasts for promotions, for example. We realized we only need that um, maybe during around midnight because it's a batch process again. Um, and that's when we send out all of our promotional emails. So we don't wanna have to scale our whole uh, container during midnight, we just want to scale out the email user functionality. And maybe we also want to make this um, available for some of our other services or other monoliths or other applications running that we don't see here. Um, in this way, this API endpoint is separate and we can call it separately from these endpoints and it's separately scalable. So just some points here, some of these architecture examples we just saw could be considered partially microservices depending on whether you wanna be pedantic or super um, like hardcore with the definition, right? Or you could still call them monoliths, right? Because they're not completely separated out. Um, in reality, these are just, uh, again, architecture decisions that we made um, and we did this in order to gain certain advantages, but we also had certain inherent complexity along with that. Even just explaining some of those decisions was more complicated, right? So you can imagine in each of these examples, uh, the limitations of the architecture, of the current architecture were reached and the system was just adjusted accordingly. Um, but again, most of these architecture decisions uh, were confusing and complicated. So the point here is that it's, very hard to split um, a monolith into microservices without really understanding the limits of the system um, and the overall uh, functionality and how different pieces of your system are interacting with each other. Uh, so really just understanding the dependencies, whether you're in a monolith or a microservice based architecture, uh, is super important here. And in the next webinar, essentially we'll look at these decisions more in depth and actually look at technology choices and why you would choose a certain tech stack over another um, when you're doing this kind of migration. So just a note about uh, what it means to build microservice first versus monolith first. Uh, so microservice first is just building microservices for new features immediately, and monolith first is building new features um, into a monolith essentially as a single deployed container first. So as I mentioned, some of these architecture choices were pretty complicated. Um, a lot of times it's easier when you're thinking of short-term velocity and you wanna move quickly to build a monolith first, especially if uh, the future functionality needs to be flexible and scalability isn't a huge issue for, from the beginning. So if you know right away that you aren't gonna have to be extremely scalable, um, sometimes it makes sense to build a monolith first just because you can do that much faster 
Um, and oftentimes you don't have to deal with the upfront complexity that comes with um, microservice first architecture. Um, and when I talk about complexity, I mean there's a lot of moving parts in a microservice architecture. And if you don't have the correct level of observability tooling there, it can be hard to understand the context between those different services as they're communicating with each other and understand when something goes wrong, where it's going wrong. Um, because each of those can almost be a black box if you don't have the right level of um, like monitoring in place. But I will say in other scenarios, uh, microservice first does make sense. Like for example, if I know that our old payment system is just uh, really slow and it's hooked into our monolith and I want our new payment system to be very fast and it needs to serve a bunch of other calls from different sources, um, maybe I just wanna build a payment uh, microservice so that it's just scalable from the beginning. And that also is totally fine and it makes a lot of sense. So again, it's just weighing the pros and cons uh, between architectures and deciding what makes sense for your system. And here's a graphic just to kind of better explain a lot of this. So Martin Fowler is a really great source for a lot of, um, basically a lot of these decisions and um, a lot of these choices that people are making. It's really also kind of funny looking at Martin Fowler because you can actually see what the thinking was seven years from now compared to how it is in modern times. <laughs> Uh, when microservices were just a huge fad. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we can say as a user, uh, going directly to a microservice architecture, uh, there be dragons <laughs> versus allowing a monolith to form and understanding the complexity and the boundaries in your monolith and then breaking it out into microservices might be a happier path. Um, so also what comes to mind here is the whole concept of um, YAGMI essentially. <laughs> so YAGMI stands for uh, you aren't going to need it. So sometimes building microservices immediately, especially building several at once that interact with each other, um, is not the way to go because you actually aren't going to need that level of complexity yet. Um, and you may not actually understand basically the full um, boundaries and interactions that your different features are going to have. So next, I'm just gonna dive into just a few myths about microservices and monoliths, just again, to clear up uh, these two, or I'm gonna run through two myths. Um, so <laughs> firstly, microservices are synonymous with containers. Um, that's not true, actually. In modern architecture these days, everyone practices containerization, regardless usually of whether you're building a monolith or a microservice, and that's just recommended. Um, both for the, the benefits and for velocity um, and deployability in uh, modern cloud systems. So regardless of your cloud provider, uh, most people do opt for containerization just as a best practice. And I will say in general, most um, best practices for DevOps and site reliability in modern applications apply for both monoliths and microservices. So it doesn't really matter um, which type of service you're building, um, whether it has you know, a lot of functionality split out or whether it's all built into one container, um, you should still practice containerization. Um, you should still have an external configuration store that, um, and also, for example, continuous integration to deploy your containers, et cetera. All of that still applies. Here's another myth. Um, it is much easier to build a monolith than a microservice. Uh, you need less technical and architectural skills. So this may be somewhat true, but in general, um, you still need the same amount of technical and architectural skills. So you might need less infrastructure operation skills, and that's just because um, you may not need to uh, deal with different types of containers and deal with different um, scalability policies and load balancing, for example. Um, you may not need to deal with as much distributed state. Um, that's because you won't have the state spread out across different microservices. Ideally, people say microservices, microservices should be stateless, um, but I think in practice, that's not necessarily true. Sometimes they do have state, even if it's just temporary. 
Um, so there is still inherent complexity that you may not have to deal with, um, but you still need the same uh, base technical and architectural skills. And that's because best practices like modularity, uh, shared libraries, various testing structures, et cetera, are important regardless of what you're building. And this is also, these best practices are also important because they protect us um, from not being able to understand our dependency structure. Because again, regardless of whether we have a monolith or a microservices, microservice, uh, we really need to understand uh, what the dependencies are in between all these interacting pieces of our code um, and make maintainable code or else uh, we're gonna end up in a bad spot. And especially if you are building a monolith and planning on moving to microservices afterwards, um, you do want to have uh, modularity um, and testing structures, et cetera, in order to understand when you break those dependencies as you split out into a microservice architecture from a monolith. It makes the split a lot easier. Now I'm just gonna go over um, some general comparisons. So this is uh, pretty straightforward, right? Uh, monolithic versus service-oriented. And I say service-oriented again because you could call them microservices or you could say it's more service-oriented. Um, in modern times, people like to say service-oriented sometimes versus microservices, but you can consider it the same thing. Um, in monolith, um, Code modularity, despite that being a best practice, is not always followed. Um, whereas in microservices, we do tend to see uh, a more modular code base. Um, functionally, monoliths are not modular because those functionalities are all um, in one application, in one container. They are not split apart. So therefore, the functionality is just not modular, whereas in microservices and service-oriented architectures, um, this fosters much more modular functionality, even if a microservice or a service-based uh, um, system has maybe two functionalities per container, um, that's still uh, more modular than what you see in a more monolithic type of architecture. In monoliths, uh, velocity in general tends to be slower among distributed teams, so this is something that we actually haven't talked about yet. Um, in distributed teams, uh, working independently, it can be hard to all work on the same exact code base and the same exact uh, monolith because um, there's just a lot of coordination that needs to happen there. Uh, whereas with microservices, um, this can be uh, more ideal for distributed teams just because teams can function independently without constantly having to worry about breaking different dependencies or different areas of the code. Um, that another team is relying on. Um, and monoliths are not independently scalable. So again, as we saw in that architecture example, um, if we want to scale one piece of functionality, um, we have to scale the whole monolith every single time, and this can get costly and not maintainable. Uh, whereas with microservice-based ar architecture, um, this enables uh, more scalable functionality where we can just scale one portion of our system instead of scaling the whole thing. Um, monoliths also tend to have more shared ownership, which also means a greater chance of accruing tech debt, uh, just because no one person owns any part of the system. Uh, so therefore, you know, the, the overall health of the monolith is more shared, but that just means also that uh, because it doesn't foster that more individual ownership um, as microservices do, um, there's just greater chance of letting things get old, accruing tech debt, uh, having less testing um, within your monolith, et cetera. Um, monoliths also are more difficult to uh, create as fully fault tolerant. So there's more chance there of cascading failures. And again, that's just because in a monolith, there are a lot more dependencies between different features and different functionalities. So if one portion breaks, um, there's much more a greater chance of having a cascading failure. Um, whereas with microservice-based architectures, it's sometimes easier to build with more fault tolerance. So let's say we have a certain, for example, like a certain um, third party that we know is sometimes very slow and sometimes um, 
needs to, uh, or sometimes goes down, let's say, or something like that. Um, and when that third party goes down, maybe our microservice that is talking to that third party um, also goes down, but we can just have it spin back up. It's much easier to have that microservice be a separate piece of functionality and have it just have a restart policy um, that basically contains the failure there to just one portion of my system um, than having a monolith where if one portion fails, maybe it crashes the whole container. And when I talk about fault tolerance, there's planned fault tolerance and there's unplanned fault tolerance, right? So a lot of times when these issues come up, they aren't things that we actually planned for. Um, they're just things that happen and we need our containers to be resistant to it so that we don't cause cascading failures. Um, and lastly, um, again, with monoliths, sometimes in the short term, this uh, allows for faster velocity within a single team. Uh, so microservices by default tend to be more complex um, and that's just due to having distributed uh, state and distributed functionality. Um, even if there isn't any state in your microservices and they're stateless, uh, there's still state somewhere usually, even at the data store level. And sometimes this is hard to understand, um, especially when trying to diagnose failures where you don't know which actual service was the one that caused the failure, for example. And we see this even more with serverless actually. So not saying that serverless isn't great because it is, um, but uh, serverless based architectures uh, take this a little bit to the extreme where there's no state anywhere. Um, and it sometimes causes hard to diagnose failures um, if you don't have the right level of contextual observability. So, Next, I wanted to discuss here some key signals um, that I've seen before in my experience that indicate when it's time to split a monolith apart, especially if we're building monolith first. Um, so lack of maintainability is probably one of the biggest ones. Basically, this happens when no one fully understands the complex relationships between different parts of the code base, um, and it's becoming slower and more riskier to build new features or services and successfully integrate them. Um, maybe even your individual engineers are starting to like put up red flags because they feel like it's so risky to deploy and you're like avoiding deploying on Fridays because who knows what might happen. And even things like straightforward upgrades to library versions are challenging and time consuming just because again, you don't understand all the dependencies and you don't know what might break. Um, so this definitely, can happen even if we're following those best practices with the modular code base. Um, lack of maintainability is just a fact of life in code. Um, eventually it just happens unless you are really on top of tech set. Um, but with monoliths, it happens to the extreme and it definitely is one of the reasons why people like to split into microservices. Just because even just refactoring the monolith can be a huge process, um, like a huge undertaking when it's much easier to just split out that old functionality. So concerns with scaling and fault tolerance. Um, when portions of functionality begin to air out, um, unrelated portions of the system go down as well. This is one of those signals again that it's time to maybe switch over to more microservice approach in your architecture. Um, if the monolith holds state, for example, maybe recovering from crashes is really complex and time consuming. Um, so this even I've seen at companies that I worked at as an engineer, basically we have, we had an old monolith um, that just held a certain portion of state and every time it crashed, um, we would have to spend quite a deal of time um, just basically reproducing what state it had before um, in order to not break the whole system. Definitely not ideal. It's not fault tolerant at all. Um, <clears throat> finally, parts of the monolith are receiving larger volumes of traffic, are performing CPU or memory heavy operations, making it hard to scale for all functionality. Um, so again, this is that same issue we saw when we were looking at that um, original diagram of architecture. Of, in that example, um, it becomes hard to scale 
certain pieces of functionality because we are just duplicating that container over and over. Um, and it has several pieces of functionality there with different bounds on um, its scaling, right? So some functionality may, may be memory bound, some may be CPU bound, some, some may even be network ingress bound. Uh, maybe you even have data stores that are causing the bound. So for example, too many connections or things like that, and that's what's really causing the bound. Um, regardless of where you're seeing those scalability issues, that oftentimes is an indicator uh, of uh, when to split up that piece of functionality from the larger monolith. So another uh, key signal here is organizational growth. And I will also say, in addition to growth, it can also be, um, like a signal can also be organizational change, essentially. Um, when engineering teams are expanding um, and new teams are spinning up or maybe becoming more distributed um, across product features, for example, or across uh, regions even, um, it becomes easier to work on your uh, yeah, monoliths into microservices team can have ownership of certain services without owning the whole thing. Um, so another signal here is when uh, the building velocity is just slowing down due to the amount of coordination that's required to build. So maybe certain teams are constantly having to meet all the time to not uh, step on each other's toes uh, when they're developing features. It's a good time for a split possibly. Um, and again, another indicator is just lack of parallelizability, essentially, uh, because underlying functionality is just so intertwined in that uh, monolithic based architecture. And here's just some advice at a high level of preparing for the split, just so you're organizationally ready for it. And this doesn't all need to happen. Um, and you may have actually already figured out a lot of these different tasks in your monolith before to microservices. But essentially, each of these different tasks here needs to be scalable and repeatable across different teams. Um, because as you start uh, encouraging people to split pieces off your monolith, um, they need to be able to perform all of these different steps without breaking your whole system, right? So firstly, a standard automated deployment process with the ability to add or remove containers easily uh, this is super important. This is just basically figuring out how the developer operations are going to work. Um, I see these days a lot of teams actually own the DevOps as well for their services. Um, and there, a lot of times there isn't like a set DevOps person anymore in organizations. So team is going to need to own this deployment process. It's important to have it figured out ahead of time so that um, they don't have to deal with that um, unexpected complexity when it's time to start splitting up services. Um, auto scaling and load balancing capabilities, this is kind of a given. Um, usually most cloud providers these days do have these capabilities, um, but the key part here is understanding how to configure these capabilities in a scalable way. So maybe you need to change the auto scaling policy, for example, for a particular service or adjust it, or you need to just, um, also adjust how your load balancing works, for example, or keep that somewhere. Um, just understanding how this is gonna work, maybe even just using Terraform or something like that um, is important because otherwise it's kind of hard to maintain and it's easy to break. Um, and lastly, I would recommend creating some kind of step-by-step -step on how to create a new service uh, for your developers. So for example, how to add a new service configuration into the deployment cycle, um, how to set up secrets and permissions, um, how to set up alerting and monitoring, um, maybe even also how to configure uh, having that service talk to another service, right? Because if you're splitting up a certain piece of functionality, um, maybe it needs to also talk to some other fun uh, uh, service elsewhere or needs to talk back to your monolith, et cetera. Um, that's another one of those gotchas, right? Um, so. Really, the recommendation here is to have a spike uh, to document how to do these tasks within your cloud provider and understanding the limitations there before your team starts writing microservices. So really, you want maybe um, maybe even just having like one team experiment with all of this and figure it out first um, is the way to go. But otherwise, what I've seen here is um, this organizational wide, okay, time to split out all of our services, every team, go do it. 
and they all figure out um, all of these different steps independently and have their own processes for it. And it leads to just a lot of complexity in um, your architecture and lack of across different teams. And note on uh, setting up observability for these new services. Um, this is actually very important. Uh, so in monoliths, it tends to be kind of easier to monitor them, uh, especially if you're using one of those older tools like New Relic APM, for example, um, just because it um, is built for monoliths, essentially. So usually people building monoliths are used to that kind of observability tooling. But um, once you start splitting into microservices, you may find that it uh, your current observability tool is harder to uh, scale. Maybe it's harder to handle high throughput. Um, maybe they charge you a ton of money for um, every host, node, or instance. So I've seen it even explode, like moving to serverless, because you have a lot of ephemeral serverless functions. Adding observability onto each one um, can lead to a cost for literally every single function run. Um, and that is just crazy. So definitely make sure your observability tool is going to be able to handle. Um, basically a more distributed approach um, to monitoring. And really what's key here uh, when figuring out how to set up your observability for your microservices, um, the key here is to have that observability tool be able to understand context between distributed systems um, just to help find those crazy bugs that are happening throughout your different uh, services, right? So even if you just have uh, metrics and logging, that doesn't always cover the interaction between different um, services. Lastly, um, you probably want some kind of tooling that isn't time intensive to instrument um, and isn't limited on data volume or cardinality. So this is another uh, thing that I've seen before. So as you're scaling out into microservices, you also are adding increasing complexity, increasing cardinality in your observability solution and a solution that does charge on cardinality can um, definitely explode here just because you have too many services running uh, with their own functionalities, right? Because we split everything up um, and that is not fun to deal with. <laughs> um, so with that being said, uh, let's start with Q&A. And I will also add just like a short plug here to try out our solution, uh, lightstep.com slash play. Uh, Lightstep is basically an observability tool um, that includes both metrics, logging, and tracing um, all together and is able to handle these uh, type of issues because it's built by uh, people who have understood how to split a monolith apart and understand the complexities between microservice architectures and distributed systems in modern times. So awesome. now I will switch over to Q&A. Yeah. Okay, great. So we've gotten some questions in, uh, but if you do have a question for Stephanie, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And uh, why don't we go ahead and start with this one, which is, what's the best first step to begin a migration to microservices? Sure. Yeah. So um, the best first step, I would say, to begin migrating um, is understanding dependencies in your monolith first. Uh, so make sure that you understand the boundaries um, in functionality in your monolith. Um, and for example, if your monolith is not operating with RESTful APIs, this can also help. Um, creating RESTful APIs in a layer on top of your monolith will help you understand where your functionality is intertwined and where it makes sense to do a logical split. Um, and this is also where things that include tracing come in handy because distributed tracing helps you understand your dependencies um, regardless of whether you're running microservices or monoliths um, and understand where you can split certain functionality in a safe way. All right, great. Uh, okay, our next question here. Our applications are largely built on a monolith and we don't plan to migrate to microservices, at least not in the short term. How can we best leverage observability? So I would say, um, again, in this case, um, understanding dependencies is still critical. 
um, in a containerized world, even without microservices, uh, we're still scaling copies of the monolith um, based on understanding different load and where that's happening um, within our different functionalities in our monolith. Um, so how do you really understand where the different um, load is coming from in our monolith and how do we keep it healthy? Um, still understanding dependencies. Um, and if, if the dependencies aren't clear in that monolith, um, then it's basically an Achilles heel. So um, just trying to keep the complexity under control, even if you aren't planning to switch. Um, and that's where leveraging an observability tool that can handle um, the basically understanding the amount of complexity there um, effectively. So if you just have metrics and logs, for example, um, you may not understand how your system is interacting internally anyways. Like where do where are your boundaries, for example, between your different libraries? Um, when are certain libraries used on certain code paths and when are they not? Um, that kind of information um, really relies on a more complete observability tool that includes um, tracing as well is what I would recommend. All right. Excellent. Great. Uh, next question here. If you build a monolith first, are there things you should do during the initial development to enable breaking the monolith into microservices later? Yeah, so that's definitely a great question. I would say um, modularity is super important. So again, all those best practices where we um, practice like a dry code base and we have all of our libraries um, clearly split um, is super important. Um, I would also encourage uh, people to include tracing right away. So obviously I'm at Lightstep and we're a big fan of tracing, but even before this, um, I was always a huge fan of tracing because um, it allows you to uh, see where your dependencies are. So if you're building with tracing in mind and with um, modularity in mind, basically that will enable you to make the split a lot easier because you'll be able to see uh, where certain modules are being used for certain functionality um, and the splits will become more clear versus if you're not able to understand the dependencies um, in your monolith. All right, great. Boy, we've got some really great questions in so far, but there's plenty of time. If you uh, have a question for Stephanie, go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel. Our next question is actually more of a comment. Um, I think on the benefits of microservices, it's worth mentioning faster build times and faster feedback on the positive side and the ability to reduce spend on the build platform. I guess he wanted to give his two cents. Do you have any thoughts on those? I mean, I definitely agree. <laughs> I think it is worth mentioning. So yeah, um, you definitely do get faster uh, build time and feedback with microservices versus with um, a huge monolith. I think that is definitely a part of velocity there. Um, and even also, I will say, um, going even from microservices to serverless, this becomes even more obvious. Um, so serverless actually gives you even faster build times and faster feedback cycles um, and also reduces the spend even more on the build platform. So this is definitely true. As you continue to split out functionality, uh, the feedback loop does become much smaller. Okay, great. Uh, next question, uh, I think I'm gonna get it right. Uh, is splitting the code before data a best practice? um splitting the code before data so i'm not sure if i completely understand what this question um is asking but okay. if i'm interpreting it correctly i think it's saying um basically uh splitting up a code base but relying on the same data store um like is is that a best practice um i would say again it just depends on what uh your architecture needs right so if you're overloading your data storage and you're seeing a lot of you know uh connection pool full or your uh your sql database is just not able to handle the load anymore because you're using it for the wrong reasons um then it might be more important to figure out a split on your data storage um before figuring out um a more microservice approach and you might even ha just have to do that together um it depends again on the needs of your architecture Okay. All right. Great. Next question. How can we store data in microservices uh, in the one or in multiple databases? 
currently we have one big database? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it's definitely sometimes uh, fine to rely on the same database across microservices, as long as that database can handle uh, the load, essentially. So you really start seeing issues when um, basically the database uh, starts falling over or it's not meant for the particular use case. Um, and then that's when you probably want to do a split on databases. So maybe one big SQL instance is fine for, for you know, like uh, basic data, like account storage in that example that we looked at. Um, but maybe we have something with much higher throughput um, that will need something like AWS Dynamo um, DB, for example. Um, then it makes sense to spin up another database um, in Dynamo to handle that kind of um, throughput and that functionality. So um, your data storage choices uh, don't really depend on uh, your microservices exactly. Uh, again, it's just an overall architecture decision. Um, but I would say that um, I would err on the side of splitting up your database storage or your data storage um, when those access patterns um, make sense for the split. All right. Excellent. Well, I can't believe how good these questions are that have come in, and we, we're, we still have a few few to go. But uh, there is plenty of question, there are plenty of time for questions. So if you yep. do have one, please <laughs> send it in. Okay. The next question here: Is it fair to say that microservices is more an architectural style than a single pattern, and that the paradigm sp spans software infrastructure and other areas? Yes, it's totally fair, and I completely agree. Um, and Honestly, microservices is, is a loaded term these days, but really it's about architectural style um, in modern architectures that need to be distributed um, in order to handle basically um, the access patterns and load and the distributed teams and all of that. So yeah, it's basically an architectural choice um, or orientation as you're building. It's not really um, a single pattern, I guess. Okay. Next question here. Do you have any recommendations on handling the migration and splitting the monolith database across microservices? Good question. Um, so I would say definitely um, understanding what pieces of that monolithic database it makes sense to split. Um, and then I think this question is basically asking like how to handle uh, the migration of data um, if you need to move to uh, several different databases, for example. Um, so I would say basically you just rely on that old database as read only um, and then start switching over to the new database for a certain percentage of traffic, um, for example, and then basically observing that. So. Um, Essentially, I would create the new microservice if you haven't already, um, and then start routing a certain portion of your traffic over to the new service and over to the new database. Um, and then basically observing to make sure that um, it looks like that's gonna be okay and it's handling it correctly and there aren't any uh, bad uh, red flags or errors happening um, and that the access pattern is correct and the, um, like the data architecture is looking good. Um, and then I would completely uh, move over eventually. So um, that's basically just um, using basically the capabilities of uh, moving only a certain part of traffic over are useful there, uh, whether you're using like C or AB um, testing or anything like that, or just canary deploys. Um, that's how we do it internally at Lightstep. So we found it to be very uh, useful. Okay. All right, great. Uh, next question, do you have a preferred approach for dealing with quote unquote transactions that span across multiple services? Uh, yeah, so dealing with transactions span across multiple services. Um, yeah, I would say this in general can look like a fan out in your code. Um, I think that relying on um, observability tools is my preferred approach for this particular scenario. For example, at Lightstep, I had to spin up um, a new service recently that spanned transactions across multiple services, um, that functionality. 
Um, and I immediately built with tracing in mind first. Um, and I was able to actually see even in our uh, staging and testing environments uh, where those dependencies were going and how long those different transactions were taking that I was kicking off from that parent service. Um, and it just gave me like a more holistic view um, when I was building out um, that uh, basically that new feature. So I would say uh, that's my preferred approach is to go observability first um, so that I know what I'm actually like what my um, what my load is going to be on that feature to other multiple services that I'm um, hitting and uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. All right. We are about 10 minutes to the top of the hour. So I think we have time for maybe two or three more questions. Let's see, uh, how about this one? How do you coordinate microservices effectively across a microservices sprawl, such as uh, API gateway or service mesh? Um, how to coordinate microservices effectively. So um, I'm not exactly sure um, about uh, what, what this is asking regarding coordinating them, like whether it's coordinating uh, their deployments or whether it's coordinating um, how uh, their performance is. So this question, um, I'm not super clear on, but I will say um, again that basically observability tooling can um, come in handy here, especially if you're using a service mesh. Um, it's very easy to just add tracing onto your service mesh. So for example, if you're using um, like Envoy or Istio or Ambassador um, or um, in your API gateway even, if you're using Kong or um, Nginx, things like that, um, you can actually turn on tracing with like a flip of a switch there, whether it's reporting to Lightstep or Jaeger or Zipkin, et cetera. Um, it's super easy to do that. And then from there, you can actually see what your microservices are doing and uh, where transactions are going across services. Um, and that really will help you with coordination, I would say, just to give you a lot more understanding of where your dependencies are going. All right, great. Okay, next question here. Uh, what about configuration management when it comes to microservices? Isn't there an increased overhead cost in your environment? And how does one go about dealing with this? Um, so if this is talking about deployment configuration management, I would say um, the overhead cost in that case is minimal, at least because um, from my experience anyway, um, I've always relied on uh, Terraform for a lot of my configuration management um, and that um, tends to be pretty straightforward and declarative um, and you're able to constantly basically have the state of your infrastructure and, and where your configurations are in your Terraform or in your Helm charts um, if you're using Kubernetes and Helm um, along with Terraform. So I would say the, the overhead cost um, in that case isn't huge um, but that's how I would go about um, how to do configuration management. Um, so that's my answer to that question. I'm not sure if it's not if it's completely what the person was asking though. So okay, all right, great. Uh, let's see. Um, let's look at this question. How do we know if our microservices are too fine grained? Um, so if they're too fine grained, well, if they're too fine grained, maybe they're actually uh, better as surrealist functions, right? Um, so <laughs> I, I think it's not, it's not a bad thing for them to be too fine grained. Um, I guess the, the downside there is that um, you're spinning up whole containers maybe uh, for some single piece of functionality that's very stateless. Um, and in that case, I would almost, again, recommend Lambda functions or serverless functions for that use case. Um, if it's completely stateless and doesn't need to run longer than 30 seconds, then it might be better as a serverless function or as a set of serverless functions, um, basically uh, with an API gateway, just like um, directing them to the, directing the endpoints to the right serverless function. So um, basically I would say the indicators there again are if it's running in less than 30 seconds and it's extremely stateless, um, and also maybe if it's very high throughput, um, then it might be better as a serverless function. Okay, great. We're about six minutes to the top of the hour. I think we have time for one more question, then we'll close it out. Um, and this one is kind of a big one. When moving from a monolith to a <laughs> microservices architecture, uh, how do you recommend it to handle the migration? Which functionality should we focus on first if we cannot migrate everything as a whole 
And should we develop or migrate core functions first or better focus on less priority functions? So if you have not um, done it before, um, I would say focus on something with a little bit less priority just to make sure that you are getting uh, it right when you spin up that microservice and you understand um, all of those things that I mentioned, like um, how to handle configuration in your new microservice, how to handle auto scaling, et cetera, um, and use that as like um, a lower risk basically um, example of a microservice. And then from there, uh, focus more on core functionality. But sometimes it's so critical to do the split that you don't have time uh, to focus on something less critical. And in that case, I would say um, that's okay too. Just make sure to rely on um, both your observability tools and on um, best practices like using canaries and things like that. Um, only direct a certain portion of traffic first to your microservice and see how it works and what's happening there. Um, and just to better understand when things are breaking, um, just to lower the risk there. So again, it kind of depends, uh, but I would say if you've never done it before, probably focus on a less priority functionality first uh, okay. before migrating core functionality. Excellent. Okay. All right. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for the question and answer period. If we did not get to your question, I apologize. Um, but please note that the folks at Lightstep will be getting a copy of all of the questions. So I'm sure somebody from the organization will be more than happy to follow up with you offline and get your question answered. And uh, before we close things out, I did promise at the top of the hour that we would be doing a drawing for two Amazon gift cards, but hey, bonus, it's actually three Amazon gift cards. So without further ado, let me go ahead and do the drawing for three uh, $50 Amazon gift cards. Our first winner today is Andreas G. Congratulations, Andreas. Our second winner today is Elizabeth A. Congratulations, Elizabeth. And our third and final winner is Robert G. Congratulations, Robert. And uh, we'll be following up with uh, you guys offline by email to get your gift card over to you. So please check your email. Um, also want to, want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the presentation or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Stephanie, thank you so much for such a great presentation. Good stuff. Thank you. Thanks for having and, me. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and judging from the, you know, just the number of questions that came in, lots of good stuff for the audience as well. So thanks again. Also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.